Hi there, welcome to World Plone Day. My name is Steve Piercy, and uh, I'm speaking to you from Mexico City as part of the Axolotl Sprint. <coughs> sprint. Um, today I'm going to be talking about documentation uh, using our Plone 6 documentation um, to show you um, some tools that you can use in your projects when you need to write documentation. Um, we have a lot of really cool things to uh, to demonstrate, and so you'll get the chance to see all the things that we use in our Plone 6 docs, and hopefully it'll inspire you to write um, beautiful docs as well as uh, enri uh, enriching your own documentation for your users. Um, so our tool set includes Sphinx. Sphinx is um, written in Python. It's a couple of decades old by now, um, and one of the things, some of the things that come with uh, Sphinx out of the box include um, automatic navigation generation through a table of contents directive. So you can just list the names of your files and you will get navigation structured like this, even nested documentation. You also get out of the box for free a search. So if you wanted to search for, hmm, let's say Volto Slate, oops, I can't spell. Obviously there's no results there. You will get some search results and highlighted. We've customized our version a little bit, but you can do the very same thing with your own and be able to go to whatever um, whatever uh, context is, is helpful to you. What's really great about these is that the search results are very much like Google, DuckDuckGo, most search engines where you're presented with uh, a title, breadcrumbs so that you know where inside of your documentation structure it exists, plus um, a highlighted, uh, highlighted uh, context of where of the words, so you could say, oh, this, this it might apply to me or it might not apply to me and I need to refine my terms. Um, we also have a, an ability to further filter uh, by just looking at a specific part of the documentation. Um, another really nice thing um, that you can use in yours. The Sphinx also comes right out of the box, this thing called a glossary. Now, a glossary is, is something that has a list of terms and then their definitions. And these terms don't have to be sorted. You could just keep adding them, and then the glossary will automatically, alphabetically sort them for you. And you can put any kind of content you like into these, you know, links. We even have uh, inline markup. There might even be, ah, you can put admonitions in there. Anything that you can put inside of a web page, you can put inside your glossary. One of the few, um, one of the features that most people don't even know about is that Sphinx generates an index of all of your terms for you automatically. So if you go to your general index, you can find anything at, or any, <laughs> anything that you could possibly want and just say, hmm, I wonder how I can use a cookie cutter to install Plone. And then the, another really useful feature, which I'll demonstrate later, is the ability to um, take your code and automatically generate documentation from that. And from that documentation, from their doc strings, you can also um, view the source code. And it's, it's just amazing. So we'll, we'll get to that later. Now, Sphinx itself, it has its origin by um, taking restructured text and then outputting it to various formats, including HTML, PDF, uh, Apple Help text. Um, golly, there's about a dozen different formats that you can get with Sphinx. Now that's great, but we used to just use restructured text as the input, and that was not fun. Um, Markdown support was added, but using Markdown itself, it lacks um, some of the features that you get with Sphinx 
out of the box, such as indexing and a glossary and all those other things. Um, so to make up for that, there's been a hybrid of Markdown with restructured text. So you can use, you can write your documentation in plain old Markdown um, where you have headings with just a number sign or two number signs or three number signs to have heading, subheading, sub subheading. Whereas in restructured text, you have to remember what character you're using to underline it. And that's no fun. So it's really a great tool for um, making it easier for authors to write documentation and have it well structured. Um, in our project, and I don't know if you have this in your projects, but we have, Plone is a collection of many projects. Um, in Plone 6, we have Volto. We have a REST API that the front end uses to talk to the back end. We have Plone API, which is a way for uh, various parts of Plone to talk to the very deep core of Plone and return uh, objects back. Um, and we used to have separate documentation for all these things. And to handle this, we decided to use Git submodule so that we could pull in all of that documentation into a mother repo. And from there, we have um, we use Git submodules to bring all those in and then build that documentation in one place. So if you are struggling with that kind of, uh, you know, you have your documentation over there and you have yours over there, that's one way of doing it. There's another way I will touch on later. Um, in our documentation, we also take quality very seriously. Um, and with that, we use, <clears throat> we use several commands uh, using new make, that's G-N-U make. And with those uh, commands, we're able to issue on a command line and uh, make sure that our documentation passes code quality. Whenever we have a problem, we do get errors back. So if I switch back over to one of my things, When I did a make, make target, one of the things that will be returned, oops, wasn't this one. One of the things that'll be returned are syntax errors. So for example, um, we, there is a known bug in this one, but it'll let us know that, oh, hey, I'm not able to highlight um, this block of code in a certain way and make it look pretty. And when you are alerted of those problems, you can either Acknowledge that, yeah, that's going to be a problem. We'll try to fix it in the future. Or, oh, I need to fix that now. So make HTML is uh, something that helps you right out of the box, and you can use that on your development machine. Another tool that we use is for checking English spelling and grammar. And Vail is the tool that we use that for that. Um, I ran Vail in a separate, uh, uh, in a separate terminal session earlier. And as you can see, we have many, many errors in our documentation. A lot of them are just suggestions um, because they're trying to set the tone or voice. One of the cool things that Veil vale gives you is you can use various plugins to get um, suggestions to help improve your documentation. So one thing that we want to do, encourage people to use is the active voice when they're writing their documentation instead of a passive voice. So um, we try to talk to the user. You can do this instead of, it is possible to do this. Um, when we have some misspelled words, like one of the most common ones is, uh, we have SAS. Uh, it'll check to say, hey, look, um, SAS is not defined as an acronym. Maybe you want to actually put that into a term and spell it out as something else. But maybe, oh wait, no, you actually have it as a spelling term. And for some reason, you used it all in capital letters. It's actually capital S, lowercase a -S, s. And so it can help you correct your spellings and even getting the right branding and identity, which is critical <laughs> within the JavaScript world. You don't know if it's node dot, lowercase js, 
Or is it no JS without a dot? Or is it, do you capitalize the JS at the end? Who knows? Well, now you have a way of checking that. Um, we also have link checking. Uh, one of the problems that we've had with previous versions of Plone documentation is, is link rot. Well, we enforce that, and I deliberately put a bad link into our, um, into our documentation when I was pre uh, preparing this. And uh, I ran the command, make link check broken, so that it returned only the broken links. And it informed me that on my index page, line 8 19, there's a problem. This page redirects to another page. And you might not notice that when you're writing your code. And it's because that should have been HTTPS. So these are little tiny things that can help save you know, your time and energy and make sure that you know, one thing that happens a lot again, with other people's documentation when you're referring to it, is that they'll move it with a whole section into a new thing, or they'll upgrade the version. And so how do you make sure that your links are still good? Link check broken. Um, and the most exciting part, this is my favorite part, is having something where you can write your code and preview it in real time. So I'm going to go over to our index page back there, okay? And what I did is uh, I just did make live HTML, and I am serving the documentation from my local machine. And to prove that, I'll just uncomment a couple of things, save it, and the documentation rebuilds, it reloads, and it automatically reloads the page with the now present content. Yay! And if I were to delete it, it would then reload and go away. All right, but there's more. We decided on, um, on a theme that helps us do a lot of things and present content um, that's much more usable. We're using a, a, a theme <laughs> that's based on, uh, um, first, we have our own customizations of a theme called Sphinx Book Theme, which is in turn based on PyData theme, which is in turn based on uh, the Sphinx Basic theme. And all of those things together, that's a pretty complicated stack, but um, these themes are very heavily used in the Python community, um, and they do generate beautiful documentation, as you can see. Um, and they have a couple of things that uh, make it easy to navigate your documentation. Um, one of the first things it has is this meta nav bar that sticks up at the top and it allows you to you know, change to full screen mode. Has a couple of links to various resources and allows you to download the source files or the whole thing as a PDF. Um, we have this navigation, which I mentioned earlier, um, but it also has sub-navigation and scroll spy. So as you scroll through, things show up. Hey, that's pretty cool. All right couple more features of this theme. Uh, clone training is on the next version of the theme that we are going to apply, hopefully during this sprint, to the Plone 6 documentation. And a couple of those features include dark mode, uh, a nice scroll spy type of thing where you start to back scroll and, oh, that's nice. I don't have to scroll all the way myself. I can just click a button. Um, the typography, it looks a little bit better. Linking is a little more emphasized. And we have a lot of nice little touches that have been uh, added and developed uh, by those themes that we're built on. So we're hoping to get that integrated in the next release. We, um, oh, I should do that too. 
This theme is also mobile first. So as I resize it, navigation is shown in hide, hid. I can toggle navigation. I can also toggle local page content. And of course, it still looks beautiful. Um, and when you're on a mobile device, a tablet, or just your phone and you want to look up something while you're coding, you have a very convenient way of getting access to this. Um, I already talked about those two things. In our documentation, we also have uh, a very high concern for getting good search engine optimization results. So when all the search engines are looking for our site, we want to make sure that they find us. So we build a sitemap. This is a, a Sphinx extension. Comes, you just install it, and it'll generate your sitemap. And all those links will be put into, you know, they will be crawled by search engines, and it will help improve your uh, search engine ranking and results. Also, in our, in the source of our pages, we have Open Graph stuff, which is automatically generated. Uh, by putting code into HTML meta stuff. And that is just this kind of stuff. So that, a little plugin where we can say, hey, here's just the stuff that we need. The open graph stuff gets generated for it automatically for us. This is another great way of helping improve your search engine results. All right, what else? So the rest of my presentation is more just on the presentation of our content, making it look uh, attractive, making it more usable, more navigable. So um, we have various Sphinx extensions. Um, one of those is uh, Sphinx Design. And this is an amazing one. It it's, it's uses elements, it pulls elements from uh, Twitter Bootstrap. Uh, and its design, and incorporates that in uh, these themes very easily. So uh, one of the first ones are using tabs. And for here, we have an example where, hey, if you wanted to install something in one on one operating system or another, you have your very own customized command ready to go. Um, we have grids. Grids allow you to arrange content just like you would have columns. And you, know, you have a, you know, a row div, and then you have your column div. This is the same concept. Um, these are also um, called cards. So we have cards that are in a grid. And uh, we also have, let's put that over here. We also have buttons with drop downs. This is all Sphinx design plugin stuff. You just create the markup, and it creates the object for you. Um, we have enhanced images. Um, and by enhanced, let's say that this is not, usually you'll see something really tiny on a screen. Oh, I can't see that at all. Well, you can click it, and it'll actually show you the full size image in the original one. Um, and we can also do things that are some nice touches by putting it into a card with a little drop shadow or a little glow around the side so that you can tell that this is actually an image and not part of the page. Uh, and you can put even helpful things like alt text and captions so that the caption matches the image, which is, you know, wow, I want to be able to have screenshots and describe what that screenshot is, now you can put it all together, and it's really useful for people who um, also want to have accessibility, uh, guide, light, and satisfied. All right, and of course, all of this can be combined into all the above, as I showed in uh, the, um, the uh, cards, uh, where you can have them in a grid and have them be clickable. Um, we have a couple of other neat things. Um, that uh, are really hard to do, but we're able to do inline images so that that image, it's not an icon or a fab icon thing. That's a real image being displayed inline. That's something that's really difficult to do in any mark, markdown language. Um, so 
now you get that for free. And this is super great if you are doing things where you're trying to say, click on this button and not disrupt the flow of your text. Uh, we got videos. Embedding videos and documentation is really difficult, but um, we have it so that it is always at the right size, depending on your screen. So this will help make it always be at the right size and allow you to have a player that you can also resize to full screen, has all those nice little features in there that really will help with your documentation. All right, we're gonna pause that, stop moving. Um, we have diagrams. If you've ever heard of something called GraphViz, you can write something like this, and it'll be rendered to an image. And so you don't need to get an expensive, you know, charting thing to, you could create these things just with words and symbols. Wow, isn't that great? And, and it centers it for you. And it has the arrows connecting from one object to another. You don't have to drag them around anymore. So uh, this is just a basic example. If you wanted to see some really fancy stuff, you could go check out Graphviz's website and um, try out some of their examples. Uh, code blocks. Now, code blocks are really cool. This is a basic thing, but oh, it's so hard to get it right. Um, basically, all you have to do is put triple ticks, the language name, and then your code and close that uh, triple tick. And this is how it will render. On top of that, we can do fancy things like highlight some lines. And this is something that you get when you wanted to, that you can't do in Markdown, but you can with restructured text. So with restructured text, you have to insert here, I'm going to use a code block. Here's its language. I want to have line numbers to say, hey, this is line number one, two, and three. And then I want to emphasize the first and third line. And you can do that with highlighting. This is great. But wait, there's more. You can also have this copy button where you can click it and have that onto your pasteboard. And there's no trailing white spaces <sighs> or carriage returns or all that other stuff. This is exciting stuff for people who want to get started with installing something and they can never you know, copy the commands correctly. Well, now they got a chance to do this right. Um, we have definition lists. Um, definition lists are, again, they're similar to glossaries. Again, you have a term, um, but instead of sorting it, you can put it into any order and still put in other uh, stuff, um, any other arbitrary content. Um, and this is really helpful for um, defining things like we have in our example here, um, some of the, um, uh, what do we call them? The, um, anyway, the thingies, uh, I'm blanking on the term, where uh, you can just refer to um, the item and then have the term explained for, for you. Uh, next. Ah, this is a great one, substitution. So if you have something that you, need to update from time to time um, in multiple places in your documentation. For example, we need to support Python version 3, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. Well, that's really painful to search and replace in your documentation. But if you define it as a substitution, you just put it into your configuration file and it'll be rendered wherever you put that substitution. Um, Intersphinx is another way of doing cross-referencing. So I did mention earlier um, that you could um, uh, have um, refer to external docs um, or checking, checking links. Well, this is another way to ensure that the links are always uh, using, uh, have integrity. Within the Python world, if you're using Sphinx, 
it generates this thing called an um, objects.inv file for inventory. And it has an inventory of all the objects, which are then showing up in your general index file that I talked about at the very beginning. And all of those things have links to that, in, uh, to that object in your documentation. So all you need is to know the object reference and put that in your documentation. And then you never need to provide an absolute URL that will change over time. So that's a nice tool to go between documentation that uses Sphinx. And we have a couple of other really nice things um, with uh, the Plone REST API. So Plone REST API is, again, it's something where um, a front end can send a, an HTTP request to the, to the REST API, which returns a, uh, an HTTP response. And we have um, two plugins that help accomplish that. First, we have examples that can be used uh, by various um, applications or, or packages. Uh, we have these four, HTTP curl, HTTP pi, and Python requests that can send these requests. And here's a, an example of the request that would be sent with a body, which again can be copied and you can format it as you need. And, and then uh, we can have responses documented. So uh, responses are shown here. This is really cool so that you can see the examples and make sure that when you are making a call to an API that you have formatted it correctly and that you're getting an expected response. Uh, and then uh, the last couple of things, the last thing is something that also I mentioned at the very beginning comes free with most Sphinx documentation uh, and it's overlooked outside of the Python world. But um, wouldn't it be great to have, when you write your code, you have your doc strings and then have your doc strings rendered into your end user documentation. That's what this does. This, uh, it is called, um, uh, it's called uh, auto summary. And it will um, basically summarize all of, your, uh, all of your Python classes, methods, anything you want. And it will have a very nice presentation of uh, your method name. Uh, its namespace and any arguments and whether and what their default type uh, default values are and then you can also you know have a description and further define what the parameters are uh, and say what it returns its return type what it raises if there's an error um, and then uh, have and link to an example of how it's actually used underneath the API how to create a user but wait, there's one more thing. If you still don't get it, you can click this source button to view the actual source code. And here you can see this is our doc string that gets rendered into HTML documentation or any other kind of format output. So with that, um, there's even more stuff that I haven't even covered, but most of it is not as attractive or flashy as that. There's these little touches that we have, but we do have a list of um, missed extensions and Sphinx extensions that we use in our documentation. Um, and we also have underneath our Plone 6 documentation, uh, how to contribute to documentation and how to get started. So if you wanted to clone our repository, say, you know, and make HTML, you're ready to go. You'll actually get this output and you can start playing with Sphinx and, with, and then take these ideas and put them into your own documentation. Uh, so that's all I have and I'm really excited to get more good documentation and I hope if you have any questions uh, that you feel free and comfortable to come up and ask me at any time, um, either here during our sprint uh, World Plone Day, I hope to be available for that too. And anytime, uh, I'm often hanging out in, in Discord in the documentation channel. Thank you. Any questions from the audience?
Yes, Erico, microphone. Hello, hello. How do you feel about creating a cookie cutter for documentation? Because uh, that would go a really, really long way to all projects kind of share the same settings by default and so on. Um, yeah, that could be done with all the goodies. Uh, some things, yeah, there are the things that would require manual intervention. There is like, um, for graph biz, I think you still need to have um, a step where you manually install it onto your system. But uh, other than that, yeah, I think we could do that. Yeah. We, we could exclude it because it does add a complication, but we could say, hey, if you do want to do it, here's how you do it, and you're ready to go. Um, but basically, I do want to have... Uh, what we call is the kitchen sink. Um, and there is actually, well, that's not the one I wanted, uh, the Sphinx book theme. I think it has a kitchen sink. Where are you? Oh, oh there it is. Where, there we go. So the kitchen sink is an example of all the things that this theme can do. And so that would be uh, what I would do. Uh, one of the things that I just discovered in this one, um, other than API documentation, um, was um, how to have code samples of missed syntax, write them only once, and then have them rendered, which was why didn't I think of that before? Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Great. Thank you.